ladies and gents. In this video, we're going to take a look at the 2019 exam paper question on the bonding and shapes of molecules. Um, so let's go ahead and uh, let's figure out how many marks it is. It's 25 marks. So in this section, you've got about 10 minutes. And then underneath, there's a little six marker question. So we can add on maybe another few minutes for that. So you've got 10 minutes plus maybe two, uh, which is about 12 minutes altogether for this section. So go ahead and uh, let's set a timer and we'll get cracking on it. Right, the first thing, as you can see, is uh, straight up define. So you've got to give an exact explanation for what electronegativity is. So uh, what we're going to do here is we are going to go ahead and write down at the side here, electronegativity. So when we're laying out our question, it's always a good idea to clarify what it is that you're talking about. Helps you to link ideas. It's a really good practice to get into full revision. So we'll go ahead and I'm going to ask you guys if you can remember what, uh, or if you've learned properly what electronegativity is, go ahead, pause the video, write down the explanation now. All right, so uh, what you should have said uh, is pretty straightforward. It's always the same every year what they'll accept for this. It's the relative attraction. So if you've got two atoms in a bond, it's the relative attraction. Each one of them is going to be attracted differently towards the electrons in the bond. So it's the relative attraction an atom has for the shared pair of electrons of electrons in a covalent bond. I would suggest if you have never seen that before, you don't know what electronegativity is, then you're not ready to do this question yet. You need to go and watch some of the videos about chemical bonding. You really shouldn't be doing these questions if this may, if you've never seen this before. All right, let's jump back over here. It says account. So you're asked to, that's the action word, account, which means give an explanation for. So account for the increase in electronegativity values across the second period of the periodic table. So what's telling you is as you move across the second period of the periodic table, n equals to two, uh, why does the electronegativity values increase as you move from left to right? Part two, account. That's what you're asked to do. Give a description of why account for electronegativity value increase, EN increase, plus N equals to two. What's the reason that that happens? Okay, so what we're doing is we're putting the descriptions of that. Okay, so if you can't, if you're struggling with this, I'll give you a couple of hints. You need to start thinking about what are the factors that affect electronegativity? Why would electronegativity go up or why would it go down? Why would some atoms attract electrons more and why would some electrons attract, some, some atoms attract electrons less? What causes the atoms to attract electrons more? What are the factors? Pause the video and write that down. All right, the factors that affect electronegativity are how positive is the nucleus of the atom? How many protons are in there? We call this the nuclear charge. So atoms with more protons in the nucleus pull electrons more, attract electrons more. The other thing that helps atoms pull on the electrons in a bond is the size of the atom. So if an atom is very small, like this dot here, it means that it can get closer to the electrons in the bond. The nucleus is closer than this one on the left. The nucleus is in the middle of this atom, okay? Uh, and it's further away because the atom is bigger. And also there might be some more shells of electrons screening the nucleus from the, um, from the um, electrons in the bond. So atomic radius is another thing that affects so the size of the atom is another thing that affects uh, a factor that affects the electronegativity. And the third thing is if there's increased screening, the screening, uh, the level of screening is going to affect the nuclear, uh, the electronegativity. So now, but now that you know that those are the factors, when you go across group two, which of these are important? So what I want you to do is identify by putting a little star beside them like that, which ones are important and are going to change as you move across group two or period two, sorry. So pause the video and decide which of these three things, there's two of them that change as you move across period two. Okay, so you should have highlighted the first one, the nuclear charge is gonna increase because as we go left to right, we're adding more protons and the atomic radius is gonna change as we move across a group. Okay, so the nuclear charge as we move left to right goes up. 
We add more protons, the nucleus becomes more positive. The atomic radius, it goes down as we go across the group. The atoms get smaller and smaller from left to right. The screening effect across a period stays the same. It doesn't change. And that's because all the new electrons that we're adding are being added to the same shell as we move across a period. Again, if this makes no sense, then you need to go and watch the video where I've explained that. You shouldn't be doing the question if you haven't learned the content yet. All right, so to write a, a, a description of that and then put it into a sentence, account for, give a reason why we we'll put it together to write something like this. Again, if you want to have a go, pause the video and have a go at putting this into a sentence now, you should probably do that now. Okay, so help on what this should look like. Uh, we would say electronegativity increases across period two due to due to uh, and you can put it in the bullet points if you want two reasons the nuclear charge is increasing and the second reason is the atomic radius is decreasing so more pull from the nucleus and smaller atoms means higher electronegativity. That's it, guys. If you don't understand that, I'm not going to spend the time doing it here because that's not fair on everybody else. I'm trying to keep these videos as short as possible. I suggest you go and watch the video where I actually explained it. Next one, use electronegativity values to predict the type of bonding in oxygen difluoride, OF2. It's okay. So the first thing we want to do is... write down the form, it's OF2. And we wanna know the type of bonding between the O and the F. Now we know that the O is gonna be attached to the two F somehow. It doesn't really matter about the shape, we're not being asked about that now. But what we are being asked is to use electronegativities to find out what type of bond that is. And obviously that one's gonna be the same because they're both OF. So find out what type of bonding the OF is. So what you need to do is get your electronegativity values table up and work out what type of bond this is. Pause the video, do that now. All right, if you're struggling and you don't have your own copy of the log tables or you don't know how to find the electronegativity values, this is them. So they should be on your screen now. I'm gonna get rid of this because that's from a previous question. And I'm gonna zoom in so you can see the two elements in question. Pause the video now and find out what type of bonding we're talking about. All right, so these are the two elements. There's oxygen, there's fluorine. So it's 3.44 for oxygen, 3.98 for fluorine. I'm gonna go back to my question. Is this one, I think. This one, I believe. Yep. So the OF2 bond is just right here. Uh, it's 3.98 on the oxygen, on the fluorine, sorry, and 3.44 on the oxygen. So what we want to do here is we want to find the electronegativity difference. And the way that works is like this. We go 3.98. And if it's a difference, we're taken away. Take away 3.44. Very simple maths, simple takeaway. Get your calculator 3.98, take away. 3.44 and that gives me a difference of equals to 0 0.54 Now you should know where that fits in in the range it's greater than 0 0.4 of a difference which means that this is polar covalent polar covalent now polar covalent will get you the, the marks but in the marking scheme you're going to see that it's actually said that it's slightly polar covalent and that's because this here is pretty close to the cutoff point of 0 0.4 where everything less than 0 0.4 is non-polar. So this isn't really much above 0 0.4, which is where this word slightly comes from. Now, it still is polar if we go by our ranges of greater than 0 0.4. So if you just said polar covalent, you will get the marks, even if you see slightly polar covalent in the marking scheme. Don't worry about that. Okay, but understand why it's slightly. It's just above our range. Right, the next bit. State and account for the shape of the OF2 molecule. So two parts, state and account. So before I even read any more now, I'm gonna lay out my question so that I cannot forget any bits. So like this, part four, it says, part one of this is state. So I'm gonna do that here, and then I'm gonna account. So this means I cannot forget to do a bit and lose marks in a stupid way. I don't wanna do that. I do not wanna lose marks because I forgot to do part of a question when I would have been able to answer it. State and account for the shape of the OF2 molecule. Right, well, I already drew this molecule up here. This is it here. So you guys should be able to state what the shape of that is and account for why is it that shape. So pause the video and state the shape. 
All right, so a couple of possible answers here, uh, just different ways of saying the same thing. Some people call this a V-shaped molecule. So if you said V-shaped, well done. Uh, other people call it a bent molecule, bent molecule. And then just gonna check them out and see me. I don't know if this one is allowed. Uh, no, there's nothing else allowed. V-shaped or bent, okay? Uh, so those are the shapes. Either of those is correct, well done. And account for, why is it V-shaped or bent? So pause the video and account for that now. Okay, so when we're accounting for the shapes of molecules, what we wanna do is we wanna look at the central atom like this. Here's the F, here's the F, and we're looking at the central atom, which is the O, okay? Now, around the O, there are four pairs of electrons. Now, it's a good idea at this point to draw in the valence electrons of oxygen. One of them is here in this bond. One of them is here in this bond. Okay, so there's two valence electrons of oxygen. There's some missing though. Pause the video and draw in the rest of them. Do that now. Okay, so here is, so we've got two pairs here. Here's a pair, a bond pair. Here's another bond pair. That's four electrons, but it's also got four more of its own. It had six valence electrons to begin with. Two of them are in bond pairs and two of them are lone pairs. So two bond pairs. And it's got two lone pairs. All right, and that's really the explanation of why this is V-shaped. These lone pairs here stop it from being linear. So the other option for O a molecule that might look like this uh, with a general formula. This is a general formula AX2, by the way. So this is AX2, where A is the oxygen and X is the fluorine. It could have been like this, AX, X, linear. It could have been linear, but it's the lone pairs on the A that push down the bond pairs to make it V-shaped. And that's why two bond pairs and two long pairs explain why this is uh, V-shaped and not linear. Okay, so this is what you arrangement of electrons. Talk about where, how the electrons are arranged, and that will uh, give you that explanation. So well done. Right, the next one. Select, given your reasons, which of these angles is the most probable value for the bond angle in oxygen difluoride? Okay. Select giving your reasons. So the options are 180. 180 is a straight line. It's definitely not linear, right? We know that. We know the shape is V-shaped like that. 109.5. Most of you will know that that is a tetrahedral shape when you've got carbon with four electrons pairs around it, and they're all bond pairs like that. So something like methane. 109.5 is the bond angle of that. There are no lone pairs. So that's 109.5. So that one can't be right either. 120 is a circle divided into three equal triangles like that. And that's usually what we're talking about when we say trigonal planar. For example, BF3, a boron with three fluorines around it. So this leaves this one. This is our only real option. Now, this might be slightly different from what we learn in class. Okay, uh, when I did water in class, when I teach water it, and I do this, I, I, we usually talk about the bond angle, each lone pair taken off um, 2.5 degrees from this 109.5. So tetrahedral, take away 2.5 for each lone pair like this, uh, which means that, that I would be expecting in a V-shaped molecule, the angle to be 105, but it's the closest one to this. So what these must be telling us is that in this molecule, the lone pairs do even more uh, repulsion than, um, than we might expect. It's a little tricky question that, but the, really the only option for the bond angle that makes sense is the 103. So we're predicting bond angle and we're given reasons for that. This is part five. So the bond angle I would predict here would be 103. And can you now pause the video and can you give a, a reason why it's 103 and not the other ones? So I'm going to go ahead and leave those up there. So if you want to rule out, why are these not? 
Uh, why are these not uh, correct, maybe? And that leaves this one at the end. Um, yeah, so rule out those ones. Why is it not those ones? Right. So what I would do here is I would talk about, well, uh, it's, it's 103 because, well, why can it not be 180? 180 is for linear molecules. Okay, uh, 109.5 is for tetrahedrals molecules. And what are tetrahedrals in terms of bond pairs and lone pairs? So how many bond pairs, how many lone pairs? Write that down there in this bracket. Okay, so I would say four bond pairs, zero lone pairs. Four bond pairs, zero lone pairs. And then for uh, 120 degrees is for uh, trigonal planar. And in terms of bond pairs and lone pairs, what's trigonal planar? Okay, so three bond pairs, and zero lone pairs. So 103 is the only one that makes sense. So 103 is for two lone pairs and two bond pairs. All right, quite a tough question. That's one of those that just separates uh, separates the best from the rest, I suppose. It's only what four marks. Um, so quite a toughie, but again, it's easy enough to rule out the ones that are wrong and give reasons why they're wrong. But giving the reasons is maybe the hard bit there, all right? Well, hopefully I've showed you if something like that came up again, how we'll go about tackling it. All right, next one. Give two differences between sigma and pi covalent bonds. So we've done this lots of times before. We're going to lay out our question so that we're comparing two things. And I always say, if you're comparing two things, you use a table. So sigma versus pi. So go ahead. I'm going to lay out a table here like this. And we're going to compare them. So sigma versus pi. So pause the video and compare sigma and pi bonds now. Okay, so the best way to describe them is to think about what type of overlap do they have. Now you can draw this or you can explain it or probably do both. Okay, so sigma bonds, if you haven't already done this, are formed by what we call the head-on overlap like that. Okay, so head-on overlap. Whereas pi are formed by, it's a bit harder to draw pi bonds, but they're formed by, this is pi and they're formed by sideways overlap. So that's one way we, compare, we can compare them. Okay, pause the video and think of another way. Okay, sigma are slightly stronger. And these are slightly weaker. That's another way you could get the marks from pairing them. Another way you could get the marks is that sigma can be for s or p orbitals. They can overlap head on, whereas pi can only be for uh, p orbitals. P orbitals only. Um, another thing that people talk about is. Uh, these are always involved in only single bonds. So that's like where we see a H bonded to a H, a single bond. Whereas pi bonds are associated with double and triple bonds. Double or triple bonds. So for example, in N, N, so N2, this is a triple bond where the first one that's formed, the bottom line we say here is a sigma and the other two are pi. So this one and this one are pi bonds. All right, so there's lots of different ways we can compare them to get the marks there. So at that stage, we're finished up. Uh, we probably took a little bit longer than the 10, than the 12 minutes because I suppose we were um, 
we were revising stuff. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave the marking scheme there, pause the video, and you can go through it and just double check that you've collected all the marks. And then there is the marking scheme for uh, that little second bit about sigma versus pi. All right, guys, that'll do. We'll see you in the next video.